Good evening. You have a good turnout in El Segundo for your candidates. Isn't that great that they're all here? Yes, this is so good. Um, I'm Diane Wallace. I'm actually not the chair of the Beach Cities uh, League. Um, uh, our chair actually should be here, but she's under the weather. So I volunteered to be here in her stead. Um, and, and actually following up on the, uh, on the Women's Club of El Segundo, the League of Women Voters was started in 1920, and we have men members as well. <laughs> Just want to assure you. And El Segundo is one of the cities that is part of our league. So if you're interested in the league, um, these are the kinds of things we do. We put on forums. Um, we do not endorse candidates, but we encourage people to register to vote, and we encourage people to vote. So you have to decide how you're going to vote. Um, so we, um, we think of ourselves as safeguarding democracy. Um, and we, we, we were formed the year that women received the right to vote in 1920. So it's a long history of supporting uh, democracy and, and voting. Um, we um, try to inform citizens about issues. And, um, and speaking of that, the League sometimes sponsors propositions on the ballot. Um, they are typically balanced. Um, we actually are getting signatures right now about a proposition that is, I would say, could be generally misunderstood. But uh, we have a proposal coming from the League to all people in California to modify Prop 13 for commercial properties only. Um, commercial properties were not included in Prop 13 and have never been reevaluated for property taxes. So, example, Disneyland opened in the 50s and they still pay the same tax that they paid in the 1950s. So, <laughs> so if you would support that, there's a, pro there's a signature page over there. Um, so we have four candidates in front of us. As I said earlier, uh, we have cards in the back for you to ask questions. These ladies up here are going to review the cards. We're going to eliminate duplicates and make sure they understand all the questions. They will hand the questions to me and then I'll read the questions once they've made their opening statements. And so we have four um, candidates and perhaps you have not met them, but if you haven't met them, you get to meet them tonight. Um, so um, we'll go in order and they have, I believe you were told by Barbara that you have two minutes. And, and our requirement in the league is that um, we must, uh, the candidates must make statements about themselves and not include anything negative about the other candidates. What a concept, right? <laughs> something, something new and different. So uh, number one is Chris Pimentel. Please begin. You, uh, you, it's your time to make your two-minute statement. Well, I was just going to talk about them, but I, <laughs> yeah, short and we change. Have, we have a timer sitting here, and she will hold up signs for you. Excellent. Uh, I'm Chris Pimentel. I am a Marine officer. I'm a veteran. I'm a candidate for city council uh, because service is something that we do in my family. Uh, I was born into a military family here in California and moved around quite a bit, uh, and in those towns, now, my father would stress when you're the new guy, it's important to always listen twice before you speak because the new guy knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. So when you sit and come to a place, and we've moved here, you know, part of what you do is you have to sit and listen and understand what makes something move, what something ticks. We are, we're involved at every level and every place that we went. My father principally through the church, my mother through civic organizations. And when he retired to Wichita, Kansas, uh, we continued that there as well. I was able to earn a scholarship to the University of Virginia. I had one of the 20 Marine Corps scholarships there uh, and served for eight years in the infantry. I got to serve in five out of the seven continents, uh, no place that really looked like El Segundo, uh, and that's a good thing, uh, except for the tank on Scattergood uh, on the south side. That's a personal hangup of mine. Uh, I will say that in the Marine Corps, I learned a lot of lessons about management and involvement and about investment in people and how to manage the expertise from those around you. From that, I went to work in a public-private partnership for the Department of Homeland Security, and ultimately, 
uh, on the private sector, was able to come to South Carol, South, Southern, excuse me, Southern California, where my wife is a native here to the South Bay. Uh, when we got here, most of our involvement, as with a lot of people, was built around the level of our children. So instantly to the Eagle's Nest board, there's soccer, there's softball, there's Little League, and on the Little League board now, uh, the Camp Kesem charity for children affected by cancer. These are the things that informed our day-to-day -day involvement. But at the same time, you look for things that, where are your skills applicable and what can you help with? Brings me to a why me and why here. Well, I work now on the management side, uh, consulting with companies all the time with how they avoid and deal with problems. And at El Segundo, we are in a spot now where we have two pretty big dragons to fight. Right? And with that comes a need for preparation and some expertise about how we're going to outdo our big pension dragon and some of the, some of the more insipid risks that come from our ballooning cost of living here. So those are things that I think I'm equipped to do. It's what I do every day in the business sector. And as you listen to our thought processes here and decisions, hopefully I can earn your vote. Thank you very much. Our second candidate to speak will be Lance Giroux. All right, my name, uh, good evening. My name is Lance Giroux, and I have been a resident homeowner and the vice president of sales at a local company here in El Segundo for the past 18 years. Uh, my wife, Jean, and I have two children. My son, Luke, is 12 years old and is a sixth grader at the middle school. My daughter, Leah, is 10 years old and is a fourth grader at, uh, at Center Street School. I'm an active volunteer in the community, currently serving as the president of the Little League, and I've been on that board for the past five years. Um, previously, I was also the president of the El Segundo Girls Softball Board and was also on that uh, board for three years. Um, and I'm also an active member of Kiwanis. I'm originally from Massachusetts and earned a degree in economics from Boston College and also sub subsequently earned an MBA. I have worked and lived all around the country and uh, internationally in China and in Mexico. Uh, and I'm very comfortable because of that in diverse settings. My inspiration for running for city council is, is simply this. I want to preserve the small community charm and identity that makes El Segundo so special. While growing the city in a way that keeps offering you and your families great schools, city services, great recreation, and a quality of life that we have become not only to expect, but enjoy. All while ensuring that our emergency services are keeping our families and our community safe. So I just wanted to thank you very much for coming out this evening and for being very involved in this election. Thank you. So our third candidate is Maria Barden. Hello, my name is Maria Barden. I've lived in El Segundo for 24 years. My husband and I purchased a home here in 1994. We have raised two children here, two daughters, Ashley and Katrina. They both went through the El Segundo public school system here, and they're both in college. Uh, Ashley is graduating in May with an environmental studies urban planning degree, which I'm very proud of. Uh, my daughter Katrina is going into nursing. Um, the, uh, I currently work at UCLA Health. Um, I have my Bachelor of Science degree in healthcare management. I was also the manager of Dr. Howard Murad here in El Segundo. I'm the president of our home association for over 12 years. My community efforts involve uh, participating and helping out with the PTA Run for Education for over 10 years. Um, I'm also a member of the Ed Foundation throughout my children's academic years here. Uh, I'm a full-time mom. I've always worked, but I've always found time to volunteer in any way I can in El Segundo. Um, the reason why I'm running for city council is because um, this is just a wonderful city. I want to give back to the community, and I just want parents and families to ensure they have the same opportunity as my family has had here. Um, we have everything here in this city. Uh, we have everything for all ages. It's a wonderful city. We have all the activities and sports events. We have the ocean. We have um, senior programs. And even for uh, our middle age, we have technology and all the things that we're headed uh, in the future, which I'm really proud to be here. Um, one thing is that you can be the most prosperous and business friendly and um, attractive city, but if you happen to have a tragedy here, that can ruin the whole reputation of the city. So my first point, and at that point, is safety is number one. Also finances, I'm really excited about the new businesses here, and I would love to promote El Segundo to generate more revenue. Thank you. So 
So the fourth opening statement will be from Scott Nickel. Evening. I was born in Hawthorne, California, originally came to El Segundo in 1992 as a permit student at the middle school. Graduated here from El Segundo High School in 1998, went on to UCLA where I got my bachelor's degree in sociology. Met my beautiful wife, Kimberly, in 2007. We were wed in 2009. She gave birth to our first son, Scotty, in 2012. Later, in 2014, gave birth to our daughter, Sullivan. My career life started here in El Segundo. At the age of 16, I got my first job at Stuffed Pizza just down the street here. I stayed in the restaurant industry through college, working at Wendy's Place Cafe, as well as tutoring at the teen center, working for the Parks and Recreation Department. Following college graduation, I entered the real estate industry. In 2009, my wife and a few business partners opened up Beach Mex Restaurant here in El Segundo, where we have proudly owned and operated that restaurant since. My volunteer life started in 2006 when I joined the El Segundo Kiwanis Club. I was made president of that club in 2016, where I proudly served my one-year term. Through Beach Mex Restaurant here in El Segundo, we've been so privileged to serve with so, uh, so many of the volunteers here in town, giving back to the youth sports programs, band, Tree Musketeers, you name it, we've given back to it. My civic career started in 2011 with my appointment to the Environmental Committee. In 2012, I was appointed to the Planning Commission, where I have served proudly for the last five and a half years, working with city staff and my fellow commissioners on many of the projects we see here and around this town. My candidacy is rooted in a desire to serve this community and all of you, the citizens. I'm hardworking, community-oriented, and experienced, and I am poised and ready to serve you, the citizens of El Segundo, as a council member here. Thank you. Please give all four of them a hand. So um, now this part of the program will be questions that have been submitted to to you, and then you're going to give more to me. Um, but while we're while we're getting all these organized, I already have some to start out with. Somebody wrote one question that's four cards long. Just saying. Um, so uh, not saying who it is, but you know who you are. Um, but. Uh, but so I'm going to read the question, and these questions are designed for each one of them to answer the question. So um, maybe with the first question, we'll begin here and, and proceed to the end of the table, okay? This is the long question we have at first. Okay. The El Segundo Police Department is facing a staffing crisis never seen before with 32% of officers eligible to retire in the next two years. The slow and lengthy process of hiring recruits, entry officers, will not solve the problem. What will you do to attract experienced lateral officers from other departments to come here, as well as retain those officers considering retirement or leaving the department for other agencies offering higher pay and benefits? So. Can I go back to the Disney question? Yeah. <laughs> sure. you know, th this is a bit near and, and dear to my heart in that Anytime you see a series of protectors, whether it's police, fire, military, uh, you do not set your resources based on a notion of what's our line item cost going to be. You trust the person in charge of administering that to describe what the mission is. And when you come to an agreement on the mission, mission is crime suppression, if the mission is investigations, whatever the mission is, then you decide how are we going to resource against that mission. Right? So if we decide as a group through our police chief, here's what we want our police to do, and how many officers does it take, then we have decided, we decide it makes more sense to attract laterals, we have to decide what does it make to feel that person, make that person feel rewarded, to make them feel valued, and make them feel like their job is something that entices them. And if we look to do that just on cost, we will lose every time. You attract people based on, do they have a job that they find fulfilling and appreciate it? Now some of it is no doubt remuneration, right? Some of it is, 100%. But if we sit here and try and compete line for line on a retirement age with Irvine, we're going to lose, right? We need to give guys attractive and exciting work, make them feel valued and resource against the mission. I forgot to mention they have one minute. I know, sorry. 
I'm just a volunteer. <laughs> okay, Scott. Thank you. Uh, I really think it comes down to a retention issue. We do need to be creative on how we are going to hire new police officers. As council people, it's important to understand our role. Our role is to support the chief of police. If the city manager feels that he has a council that is behind him, he and the chief can work diligently on trying to solve the retention problem. My understanding from speaking with the police officers that have come before those who are here now, El Segundo used to be the place to be. It was a very attractive landing site for laterals. That has changed. We used to have lots of extracurriculars, as they like to call it, where our police officers were doing more than just patrolling our streets. Understanding the things, these little intangibles that come with being a police officer and the things that they desire to have in a department, it's important. I'm not a police officer, I'm not gonna pretend to be one. What I can tell you is I'm going to listen to the chief of police, I'm going to listen to the POA, and I'm gonna work very hard with our city manager to come up with creative ways to bring more officers here and retain the ones we have. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna echo a little bit about uh, what, what Chris and Scott said because they're on, on the right track, but one of the things I wanna bring up is, is that this is not just an El Segundo issue, this is actually a national issue right now. There are less and less emergency service people that are coming into the job. You can blame the way things have been in the last few years as far as, uh, as, far as things have gone in the news and in the, co in the country. Uh, but the reality is there are fewer coming in and there are fewer highly qualified individuals to do the job. So what's happening is it's an employee's market right now. If you come out of that academy and you're one of the stars, you can basically pick your ticket to go where you want. So I really look at this as try to attract the lateral piece is an important piece of it. How do we get more officers in here who actually have the experience and can hit the ground running? The other piece is we are not going to be the highest paid uh, um, a department, but we can be competitive as far as how the benefits are given out and try to come up with a collaborative package that works for everybody. Thank you. I did, um, as I was knocking on doors, I did listen to one of the residents and they did inform me that um, they are hiring, they are training our police staff here, but apparently they're coming here for the training and then they're going to other cities because their compensation is higher. So yes, we do need to retain our staff here. So why is it that they're leaving? They have better compensation in other cities. But you have to look at how much they really value this town. If you really value your town and you have your family here, you want to make sure that this town is safe. So it's really important to hire staff that wants to be here, that they have a vested interest in wanting to be here. I think now that we have uh, new te technology that's available to our officers, um, it'll be a lot easier. In addition, there's much more crime in other cities. So we have a very good neighborhood watch system here. And uh, I just think it would be very, very valuable to leave here. Sometimes it's not about the money. It's about the value and how much you value the city that you're working in and the morale. Thank you very much. So the next question, let's start over at that end and work this way. Um, would you elaborate, please, on your vision for our downtown? parking mix, and plus business ideas. Uh, I go on Main Street often, and I'm really excited to see a lot of people from other cities coming here. They enjoy it, they don't have to pay for parking, they don't have to worry about getting a ticket, they can spend their time in the restaurant and stay longer and not worry about it. They're a little confused about the parking situation because um, the parking says generally Chevron, they don't know if they should park there or not. Uh, but um, I, I foresee some more restaurants and some, some more entertainment um, types of businesses north of Main Street. I also talked about maybe closing off Main Street so it could be just pedestrian or going to some form of angle parking. And, um, uh, but I think now with the tourism that we're going to be getting with the new tourism website, we need to have a little bit more business here that is uh, more friendly for people to come here and spend their money. Great. 
A uh, couple main things. First of all, it would be great to be able to get an actual anchor tenant on Main Street. That's something I think that uh, we could look towards. We have some great businesses down there and it's a thriving downtown, but sometimes to drive that traffic, you need that kind of one known, really known household name is one part of it. The hospitality and tourism part is huge. We are set up perfectly. We have a lot of hotels. The problem is we're having a trouble driving them into our downtown. One little thing that I learned at going to an EDAC meeting uh, about a month or so ago, if you go to the hotels in El Segundo and you ask them for a map of the city so you can go get something to eat, find, find some place to go, they will give you a map of Manhattan Beach, California. Okay, so something as simple as getting, driving people that are already there to your businesses I think is gonna be a main key to doing that. I don't think it's necessarily a huge evolution. I think a lot of marketing 101 can at least get us jump started. Thank you. Vision for downtown parking mix business ideas. Uh, recently the downtown subcommittee met and went over a few of the items that we've tried to evolve with the times to make it more business friendly. What I can tell you is being a small business owner in this town and sitting through business owner meetings, the owners on Main Street are begging for more parking. They're begging for more parking. I believe having a parking problem is a wonderful problem. That means we're doing something right and people want to be here. That said, can we do a better job of pointing them towards available parking? Yes, we can. I've gone on record saying that angled parking down Main Street might be one of those options. I've been met at doors that that may not be a good idea. What I can tell you is this. There's got to be a balance between us, the residents, and the business owners. We want a thriving downtown, but we do not want it at the detriment of us. So can we find a balance? Yes, we can. Can we all be involved in that conversation? Yes, we can. One idea that I've also come up with is rental bicycles. We have 2,500 hotel rooms. That means 2,500 guests during the week. We can pedal that traffic right down to Main Street and to our businesses. Thank you. My sense of how to fix up downtown is probably close to, to my sense of how to dress myself, right? It's not something I, it's something I defer to experts for. So I think it is a, a real skill when it comes to how to rejuvenate any urban area. And there's communities all across America that hire a specialist to do it. It's not a full-time employee, it's a limited consultancy engagement. Now my suspicions might involve bigger signs to point out in a parking garage, they might involve better lighting, they might involve a lot of things, but that's the world according to Chris and that doesn't necessarily reflect what the best way to reinforce our downtown. We know it's a key asset, we know people love to see it, the issue is how do we best get people there? Because we sat here on the stage about a month ago and someone suggested angle parking south of Grand and we were like, well, well maybe. And then come to think of it, you look and say 20 years ago it was a disaster, there's no reason to do that. So I think in this regard, to have a key asset like that, we go to the market and find someone who does it for a living. Because if you can make downtown Wichita great, Right? And someone went and did it. If you could drive people back to downtown Detroit, and someone's doing it right now, when you have a gem asset like we have, it's easy to find someone who can help us set it up for success. Thank you very much. So let's take the next question. We'll start with Scott, go this way, and end up over here. Um, this question uh, is, will you renegotiate future retirement and pension benefits for city employees as part of the solution to our pension problem? Was the question, will I renegotiate future? It just says renegotiate. Future retirement. Future yes. retirement, yes. not past retirements. Okay. Pension reform, CalPERS, what we're looking at, the unfunded liability that you hear about, this hot topic. Understand that we are a small town that chose to participate in CalPERS with many other small towns. Pension reform cannot begin here. It cannot begin in our small town. It has to start at the state level and it has to be looked at across the state. We as the citizens, number one for us has to be safety. If we go and we start renegotiation with the police department and the fire department on their pensions, they will leave. We cannot lead in this. We cannot be the leaders. The leaders always end up at the bottom. We need help from the state. We need leadership from the state. And we will work with the state towards pension reform. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, this is not a unique problem to El Segundo. This is something that ha is happening right now in, in every city in California that is part of CalPERS. Um, as a city, I think we are doing what we can. We have refinanced debt. 
um, and save some money there. Um, and we were also trying to pay our, our pension bill up front, which is also saving us a bit. But the reality in the question was about renegotiation. My feeling throughout life has been you do get what you negotiate. Um, these pensions have been worked for, they've been negotiated, they're done. The only way to affect that is, is what Scott was just talking about, is at the state level. So I think we have to be careful about taking away something that someone already has and start working on a solution going forward. And I think that is going to be the key um, to how we're going to be successful going forward. Thank you. Currently, our pension liability accounts for 16% of our general fund. Next year, it'll account for 18% of our general fund. And in 2022, it'll account for 25% of our general fund. So we need to take some measures now. Um, I work at UCLA Health. We've gone to a tier system. Uh, starting July of 2013, we started the first tier. We're now at our third tier. Currently, if you're hired at UCLA, you no longer get a particular pension. You can choose either a 401k or it's another form of uh, another 401 uh, Okay, but it, it is not the same. So they are looking forward. Uh, I'm having to pay for retirement for the people that are retiring now that's coming out of my paycheck. But um, we do need to increase revenue. That's how we'll be able to, the, the city council has done a tremendous job, a refinancing, going from a 20 year loan to a, thir I'm sorry, 30 year loan to a 20 year loan and paying back down the pensions. So they've done everything they can. The next city council will have to look for ways, thanks. When it comes to stemming the tide of, of pensions and defined benefit pensions, you know, a lot of that work was done with the Pension Reform Act, we call PEPRA, right, a few, about five years ago. So some of the things that balloon to us now are legacy issues. And when it comes to negotiating for future contracts, as contracts come up, I mean, much like you've heard here, we're negotiating within a market, right? And we have partners. And we can be as adversarial, adversarial as we would like with our partners in the services, whether it's police or fire, but the fact is they understand the market with which you're dealing, and it's dealt, you know, it's dealt with and created by other municipalities. The Los Angeles Police Department has 10,000 police officers. Not 10,001, not 9,999, they have 10,000. And they set the going price. The LA Sheriff's Department sets the going price, right? Because that's the, big, that's the elephant in the room. They, they, have, they suck up all the oxygen. So we deal in that market, and we deal with them fairly, and we deal with them with a partnership as collegially as they would like. And I think they understand what they have here as well. So I think that process moving forward. But we negotiate within that, and we deal with it sensibly. Uh, but it is a market that is set with something around us. So we have to be realistic about what it takes to attract and maintain talent. Thank you. So the next question, we'll start with Lance and then move back over to this end. Um, what is your stance on short-term rentals, such as Airbnb, in the city? Um, well, actually, I think that it provides a very good secondary source of income for people that are doing it right. All right, you have uh, people that have had either children grow up and move out, and they're looking for that secondary source, and, and I appreciate that. However. I really think that we have to start looking at this and putting controls on it because for every person that does it right, there's a house on Virginia that does it wrong. <laughs> All right, and everybody knows what I'm talking about here. So I really just think that we have to take a step back. It's not something that you can ban. I don't believe it's something you can ban because I think people can do it right, but I think we have to put some controls on it like it's a business. Be able to offer or have to offer off-street parking for the people that you have as tenants. Be owner-occupied. Make sure they're paying TOT tax the way our, we're making our hotels do. So I think it's something that we can do. I just think we have to put um, something in place to make sure that, it, that people are doing it the right way. Thank you. I am not in favor of Airbnb when it is not owner occupied. I think people are generally purchasing homes here just for that reason to get an income. Um, I am in favor of those that need supplemental income and they need to rent out a room, their kids are off in college, but I would not want to enforce a TOT tax on that. That is their own home. They should not be able to incur that tax. I think we need more transparency. I think if homes are going to be doing this on a regular basis, you'd want to know. You'd want to know why there's a different car there every week. So for me, just more transparency, know who it is just for safety reasons, but no, it has to be owner-occupied and no TOT tax. Thank you. Yeah, I think that all of us, by, by 
culture and instinct don't like telling people what to do with their property, right? But by the same token, when you live in an R1 district, you don't want to live next to a hotel. I mean, those are two uh, competing, but not necessarily oppositional ideas. The nice thing is, is that other communities have gone through this before us, right? So we can see how you can maintain it. And you can go directly through with the providers of this, whether it's VRBO or Airbnb or whomever, and they can establish controls for that. So if we sit down as a city and decide what mechanisms or what thresholds we want to build in, maybe we decide that if you're going to rent your house out for more than 30 days, then you need a business license. Right? Or if you want to do it for 90 days, let's say, then you have to have the fire inspection and all of those things. We're going to collect the TOT tax and all of those pieces. But the fact of the matter is there's cities and municipalities around the world and around the country, excuse me, around the country and around the world, that maintain these thresholds all the time through those sites, and they will collect the taxes for us. I think that there's plenty of incentive to let people make decisions about what they want to do with their property, and part of it is benefits people on fixed incomes. But by the same token, our ones don't want to live next to a hotel, and we don't want those rooms for rent going out of the long-term market either. This is a touchy subject. If you have an Airbnb, you want an Airbnb. If you live next to one, you maybe don't. <laughs> Oftentimes when you try to set resolutions at the city level and you're working on this language, you're working based upon one bad apple and you're trying to set a regulation that affects the entire R1 zone based upon one bad apple. And understand that we as city council people or myself as a current planning commissioner, you're working to try to find some sort of middle something that works for everyone. Those who need that additional income and those who feel unsafe living next door to an Airbnb. What I can tell you this is at the, planning, at the planning commission, we discussed this for over an hour. We discussed the need for it to remain owner occupied so that the neighbors did not have to self-police. We talked about having the city enter into an agreement with Airbnb so that the taxes could be collected. And we also talked about issuing a business license a $250 business license tax for those operating Airbnbs. We want to get these Airbnbs on our radar so that we have legs by which to actually try to shut them down if they are the bad apples, like a three strikes and you're out rule. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question, I think we'll just go straight down the row. Um, how do you feel about marijuana dispensaries in downtown El Segundo? Someone asked the question. You get to answer it. Yeah, you know, I... It's not your turn. We'll start here and oh, go sorry. that way. <laughs> it's one strike. <laughs> he really wanted the marijuana question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is a bit of a, of a canard in the industry that when we legalized retail and commercial sales of marijuana that it was going to be a tax boon to the municipalities which house them. The reality is that 71% tax goes to the state. And the subsequent taxes that you can gather are all taxes that the municipality would individually put on. Right? So we would have to tax something. Now, forget for a minute the, the, the cold logic of why this doesn't necessarily make sense. The fact is it's an all-cash business. And anywhere you put one of these, you have someone who's collecting an enormous amount of cash, right, from people who were previously involved in an illicit industry, and then asking us to provide services and policing around that. So find a place in El Segundo, whether it's on Sepulveda or on Main Street, that is not near a school that you would want someone making large cash transfers with armed guards every day. You know, I don't necessarily think that we want to have something that's effectively a large cash bank without safety deposit boxes anywhere near us. So it might be a great industry for our neighbors. God bless them. Uh, go for it, do great things. I'm making no value judgment on people with illegal activity. I don't think it's right for us. I think it's wrong. I don't think we should do it. We actually passed the resolution. We carried it forward to not allow any dispensaries and or warehousing within the city. I will tell you this, though, at that planning commission meeting, we had lobbyists from the marijuana lobby come to us and talk to us about big business marijuana. And there was actually a company that was, that was, and I say was, because they moved out of town, Sheft, who was housed in one of the towers on Sepulveda. And they, they, dis they distribute food from a warehouse and a kitchen in Long Beach. But the sale happens here in El Segundo, so we can tax it. And they told us, if you disallow the sale and distribution here in El Segundo, we're gonna have to move out of town the sales tax, everything that would happen here in this town, we have to move even though none of that transaction is happening in this town. It's not good for this town. We do not want to be, as one of the visitors to the Planning Commission said, we do not want to be a 420-friendly city. 
other 420 friendly cities have seen detriment to their community and it's just not right here. We have an identity, we have a culture that we need to protect and that's all I got. <laughs> um, no. Uh, I just don't, when I look at any business in El Segundo and, and anything that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a decision on, um, I look at benefits and I look at detriments. I do not see the benefits to us having that kind of business in here. We are fortunate enough to be in a situation as a city where businesses are coming to us. I think we are able to farm out the types of businesses and grow what we want to grow. No pun intended. <laughs> but I do not believe that this is something that um, has a place here, nor do we need it at all. Thank you. I don't think we want to be recognized as El Segundo, the city that has marijuana dispensaries. And it's not the right place for us. Maybe a different city. We're going to generate a lot of different people here. And for reasons, we don't know why they actually need it. I think for those that they need the CBC oil or they need the marijuana because of health reasons, you know, then they can go to those locations to get it. But I just don't see that putting that here in our town would be the right place for El Segundo. Um, it would, you know, we are El Segundo. We're the most business-friendly city there is. We don't want to be recognized at anything else than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, um, and let's start down there at the end and go this way. West West Basin Water District wants to build an ocean water desalination plant on the beach. Uh, at the NRG plant at the south border of El Segundo. What is your position on this project? And should we explore expanding recycled water first? Uh, I read, well, it was a, it's a thousand page report, so I just reviewed it last night. Um, it's really gonna be up to the, to the residents. I was really surprised that they are uh, wanting you to make comments. So on their page, on their website, um, you have until March, no, I'm sorry, May 25th to voice your concerns. And they, for CQAC, they have to, if I'm pronouncing that right, they have to respond and make sure that they answer your questions and concerns. So it's a $380 million project. Um, I think until we get more information and know exactly what we're into, but we, I know we do have to look into the future, and if it happens to be where we have absolutely no water, what are we going to use for other sources? Or what are we going to have to pay to use somebody else's maybe in Carlsbad? So I think it's worth investigating a little bit more, but I'd like to um, get more information. Thank you. Um, just, uh, the second part of that question was, are you interested in expanding recycling? Yes, I would be interested in, re in okay. recycling, yes. This seems to be the, uh, the big question nowadays. Um, I have already answered this once in, in one form and I will stay consistent with that. I have a lot of concerns about this. Um, when again, when I look at businesses and, and things that happen in this city, I look at, I look at the positives and the negatives. Um, I have read part of that our environmental impact report. I've read other environmental impact reports. Um, I think there is a, a, a very real concern about what could happen with this. So it, I do not believe at this point in time that it is a beneficial thing for us. I think we should be looking at expanding what we're already doing with recycled water. Uh, I think we are probably, I think West, uh, West Basin is probably at about two thirds capacity right now. There's a lot of room to grow that. And I think we should be looking at those things first before we start looking at building what is essentially a $400 million facility. Because then I have to ask you, forget the environmental part for a second. What is the benefit to El Segundo of this? What are we getting out of this? Follow the money and follow where the money goes. Thank you. So sorry if this answer comes out as not being very clear of taking a position. As a planning commissioner and having this environmental impact report out and a public hearing on the future agenda, I cannot publicly take a position for and or against. What I can tell you is this. If you look into drought, drought is a serious thing. If you Google South Africa, it's a scary scenario that they're dealing with there. So desalinization is one of those options to combat drought. Expanding recycled water is another option. I've drank the water from Hyperion. It tastes pretty good. I'm not telling you to run out and do the same, but you should think about it, because that could be in the future. But 
you can make arguments for it, you can make arguments against it. It may be a taxable event where we can get some tax revenue from this, but there's also an environmental impact. There's pros and cons and I look forward to seeing the comments that come through this comment period that is required by the CEQA Act and then seeing their presentation at the Planning Commission. Thank you. I'm gonna be a little bit nerdy with this uh, and then I, I was pretty excited about the concept of 20 to 60 million gallons being able to come in and wanted to see what, if there was a generational leap in technology that we should be mindful of with this. Uh, and in some desalinization plants around the world, you do see that. Ours, however, if in the EIR that these guys, that we all referred to, you know, this is a repurposing of a coolant system for the power plant. So it is an old fashioned pipe in the water, suck, or sucking in a lot of water through a one millimeter screen. So as someone who cherishes the ocean that we have here and the bay that drives a lot of people to Southern California, this represents a very real risk to the ecology and the food chain that we have out there because what gets through that one millimeter screen is little fish, little fish eggs, larvae, and the baseline and the base keystones of our food chain. Uh, the offset that they propose is to take money and rehabilitate places like wetlands in Bolana and up and down the coast. Uh, building something else in lieu of protecting what we have, I think as commissioners or council people for El Segundo is exactly what we should be doing is protecting this. Thank you. Next question. Um, let's begin with um, Scott and go that way and end up here. Um, I don't really know what this is, but I'm going to ask the question. Do you support the social host ordinance for El Segundo? I'm assuming you know what this is. I do. Okay. So the social horse host ordinance, for those that don't know, it's an it's a ordinance that's been adopted by many of our neighboring cities. And it's this idea that the city can charge, can fine you for providing alcohol to a minor. If you are a parent of a minor that is underage and you are hosting a party and allowing other children to drink at your house, the social host ordinance gives the city the option to fine you. In Palos Verdes, it's up to $2,500 for your first offense, and it can go up for the second and third offense. It's a simple ordinance that can be passed by the city. What it gives is it gives the city a, a mechanism by which to try to deter people from doing what is just wrong. I am in support of it, and uh, I hope that as a council person, I get an opportunity to hear the pitch, have our legal team work on it, and vote on it. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, especially as the parent of a 10 and a 12 year old who is about to enter that that zone that I keep talking about in the, in the, the teenage years. Um, I was actually surprised, to be honest with you, that we didn't have one of these already. Um, so yes, I mean, Scott pretty much kind of laid out what this is all about. I am very much in favor of us adopting the same ordinance. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, but this is the first time I've heard of this, but um, I, I agree that I would adopt this, but I just have a question, Scott. Um, is it up to the parent, or what if the parents are not home, and if they're just children there, and they on their own are drinking and they're underage, so who is fine? The parent, I assume, would still get fined. I don't know the answer to that question. The, the threshold for most of the South Bay cities is known or should have known which sort of depends on the, what the officer thinks. Okay, so it's up to the officer to determine the fine, if they should be fined or not. So it's only as if somebody would complain and they would come out and be cited. Is that right? Or if maybe a youngster would even mention the fact that they were drinking and underage. That's exactly right. They can't enter the house uh, without a warrant or permission. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do you want to answer? Yeah, you know, look. Uh, so here's Wait. some oddities, right? The state legislature already exempts, you know, previously a, a bartender, right? If you serve booze to somebody in California, which is unusual for a lot of states, bartender serves beer, guy goes gets in a wreck, in a lot of states that bartender can be held liable, right, for over-serving someone. California specifically exempts that, unless that person is a minor. So all of us, when we own a house with a liquor cabinet, if we're hosting something, we are already legally liable for the conduct of those people in there. It is already illegal to give alcohol or to knowingly or, or make available in a negligent manner alcohol to children. Right? So when it comes to coming up with a stipulation or an ordinance that kind of makes it crime light, and makes a responding officer the judge, jury, and execu executioner for a fine that, let's not sugarcoat it, in Hermosa can be up to $5,000. 
right, depending on what the responding officer thinks you should have known, I have real reservations about not getting my day in court. Right? I'm a parent, you all are parents, I trust the parents. We live here because we trust the parents around us to run their household in an effective manner. I don't need an officer doing that for me. If the kid's doing something illegal, then let's be liable about what's illegal, but I don't need a halfway thing for a citation crime that's up to $5,000. Excellent. So let's start over here and move this way with this question. Regarding the residential development east of Sepulveda, should it be decided by a vote of the residents or by the city council? Um, I, I'm always in favor for asking the residents. The problem with asking the residents is if the residents very, feel very strongly about something and the city council does the exact opposite, that's gonna be a real big problem. But I, I, in this case for residents east of Sepulveda, I think it affects all of us because it's a different school district. So there's a lot of things that personally affect you and your children. So I definitely think asking the residents um, what they feel about this. I personally, I am not in favor of residents east of Sepulveda. I don't think we have enough public safety staff right now, and maybe possibly in the future, but not at this time. We have things that we can do here first. Just wanna make sure the question is actually who should have the final say, am I correct on that? It's yes. not, not arguing, we're not talking about the zoning, we're just talking about who should have the final say. Right. Okay, so the way I feel about this is, uh, you elect people to make decisions, and I get that, and, and I'm a decision maker, so I'm, I'm fine with that and that responsibility. The issue with this particular thing here, this particular issue here is that it has the fundamental ability to change the entire city as we know it because you can eventually create two sides of the city, an east and a west, with two different school districts and one city council. So for that, and for that reason only, on this particular issue, I do believe it's something that should be put on the ballot, but I also feel that both sides should have the ability to argue for and against. I want full transparency on it so that you know the same as, as the people that are up on, on the dais. Thank you. I believe we as council people should be able to make this decision. I also believe we as citizens should be able to make this decision. You learn a lot knocking on doors and someone made a very compelling argument to me. They said, Scott, if you leave it up to the citizens and you have money that desperately wants to develop East of Sepulveda or PCH soon to be known, you're gonna have people canvassing the neighborhood with a marketing campaign to get the citizens to vote for residents east of Sepulveda. So this is a very slippery slope. I believe we are community. I believe the four candidates up here are vying for two seats, which sit on this city council, that I believe we are, we are stewards of this town. And with being stewards of this town, we need to hear your voice, we need to hear your involvement. I think this is too big of an issue to leave for the five of us. I believe it should be us, the citizens, that fight for what we know is right and to protect the identity that we call home. Thank you. I think through this process, the four of us, I mean, we've likely knocked on somewhere between seven and 10,000 doors. And if you don't know how we feel on this issue, right, then, then we are not being clear and we're not getting good questions. And when you elect people and have key issues, things that are existential threats, I agree with this, it's an existential question for the city. You know, we need to be clear about how we will vote. Because I think the cautionary tale is when you put things to a mass vote, and you bring in commercial forces to bear that have an unlimited bank account to send on it, spend on an issue, there is a very real risk that that outcome that you think you're voting for with us on the dais won't necessarily be the outcome you get when you have 17,000 people out there who are voting. So I think that there's an opportunity in this process where we're all involved to find out exactly how our representatives are going to, are going to vote on exact issues. I think we all tend to think the answer should be no. Right? The answer should be no. But if we put it to a broad base out there, remember the number of people we see at these meet and greets who all agree the answer should be no is probably about 1,000. You know, the number of people who are gonna vote in a 17,000 person city, you know, you're talking about 10,000, and those glossy materials could show up in a way that we don't necessarily intend. Okay, um, I have a question for the Women's Club. What is the announced time of, at eight? Okay, so we have a whole lot of more questions that we're not gonna get to. Um, I have one more question that I think we can do. Um, would you, as a council person, vote to have El Segundo City funds pay any portion of transporting students to their new swimming pool on Douglas? 
So let's start here and go that way. You did? Yeah, you know, you think when you knock on all these doors, you've gotten every question. Uh, <laughs> always somebody throwing a knuckle curve out there. Uh, you know, with this, the first question I would ask is the city attorney, is, is it legal? Does it constitute a general gift from the city to the school board in that regard, which is sometimes statutorily barred? Uh, we have an obligation as a service providing city to care for students irrespective of what school they go to or where they're going, right? And part of that is their protection. If there is not a safe way for them to be able to do something that is a sanctioned event, I think it is our obligation to look for ways to make that happen. Now, it's one thing if we have buses we can use or the school has buses that they need fuel for or something in that regard. It's a horse of another color if it involves us buying some sort of piece of capital equipment to do it. So as an overarching you know, ethos, it's, look, we want to take care of our children and make sure they're safe going from place to place, whether they're going to church, school, work, or soccer practice. Right? On the other side is we have to make sure we're on the right side of what the law says the school must provide for activities that it sanctions right, and what we can statutorily do. I see us as one city. School district, city, we are one. It's got to be a symbiotic relationship. We, the city, chose to put an aquatic center not at the high school, not at Hilltop, but we chose to put it on Douglas Street in the Wiseman School District. We, as the city, have an obligation to our children. These children are citizens. They are citizens of our city just like any other adult. I believe the city should do whatever they can within their power to help the school district get the kids from the school to the aquatic center. We did not build an aquatic center so you and I could go swim laps and you and I can go play water polo. We built the aquatic center for the children and the rest of us. We need to do something to help them and I will support that any way I can. Um, I, again, I have to echo that. I, I always think it's a good idea to be able to help out um, the schools when you can, but I, on this particular issue here, the aquatic center, my understanding, this is you're talking about mainly for high school water polo teams, high school swim teams. Your local pool is the plunge still, or our local pool is still the plunge. So I think we have to take a, a little bit of a step back on this and look at, at these things as two separate entities. Yeah, our local pool is still over here. So while that seems like something that would be, hey, that'd be a great idea to be able to offer it, we're talking about high school kids having to drive a mile and a half over there. Um, I think funds that we could utilize to help out the schools may be served in a different direction. Thank you. I think that transportation can be easily done through our Parks and Rec card that they receive. I'm, we have that online, or we're going to get that online, and most of our kids use that, and they purchase that Rec card, and that Rec card could be used for transportation um, to and from. That would allow our residents here uh, to be able to utilize that transportation. And if for other cities that want to use that, they would pay a little bit more. Um, but we do, we do need to make things easy for them to get to the aquatic center. I think that's a, it's, it's going to be an, a very fascinating. I'm excited about it, actually. I think it's going to do very, very well. And I think our kids are going to really enjoy it. And we have to make it easy for them. And then we want them to be safe. So as opposed to them walking or doing some other way there, I think it's really important to be able to transport them in a safe manner. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question, um, please discuss your vision. I don't know about this either. Please discuss your vision for the Smoky Hollow District. I'm assuming you know what this is. So let's start here. Well, let's start over there and go this way. Smoky Hollow is very exciting. I think there's so many things that we can do that, and I know that we've already started doing that. We talked about you know, mixed housing there. Uh, a lot of businesses are coming in there. I can really foresee these millennials wanting to possibly live in there and they can walk um, to various locations here. They don't have to get in their car. Uh, it's a very eccentric kind of uh, area that these kids are into. They like the, the uh, brick buildings and, and um, it's, it's, I don't want to say, it's the up and coming thing. So it really puts El Segundo on the map. So I think we're doing the things already to encourage people to go to Sm Smoky Hollow. And I think we can do a lot of things there as opposed to going uh, east of Sepulveda. So I'm, I'm excited about it. 
it's an exciting area of our town. Um, the specific plan was, was just updated and released, um, and I did look through that. And over the next 20 years, we should expect to see an increase of approximately 520,000 square feet of office, commercial, and industrial space. Um, the net net out of that is it looks like we're, we're taking down light manufacturing way down and increasing the amount of, of office space there. Um, so these are all good things. Um, the one thing that I looked at that I did not see that I would like to see a little bit more of or see what we can do with that is, is there more opportunity for mixed use residential over there? Uh, right now, I think the plan is to go from about nine to about 15 units over there over the next 20 years. However, those are caretaker units and caretaker units only. Um, and I do believe that, uh, or I would really like to look at this to see what else we can accomplish over there. Um, I understand that current zoning might be an issue there, but can we look at something else to be able to, to build in over there to accommodate more residential. Thank you. Smoky Hall specific plan is near and dear to my heart. Uh, four years ago at the Planning Commission, I asked, can we please review this area? We continually got applications up in front of us at the Planning Commission for developments where there were large boxes drawn in the center of an office area that were called research and development because it had a lower parking demand. Those properties over there are typically 25 feet wide. There's lots of curb cuts on those streets, and the parking demand that is placed on those is it's unworldly. It's just not feasible. So the new specific plan that's out, it's in the comment period now, so please read through it and comment. It is keeping in the auxiliary use of housing, so you can't have a night watchman. It is installing more parking, bicycle lanes, more walking lanes, more greenery, allowing for higher density construction. It is not kicking out the line, light manufacturing. That stays, it, it is what is called legal nonconforming. It will be grandfathered in. But it does allow for higher density creative office, which is what the demand is that we are seeing at the city. I'm excited for it. I think we open up the zoning and see where it goes. It, this is a really exciting development, and if anybody wants to look through the 70-odd pages, I mean, it, it is really the, the idea of, of governance at its best and bringing a really attractive area into the market. I think to reinforce that, you know, the government governments exist in municipalities to set conditions for people and businesses to succeed. And so one of the things we have to do is make sure that we are nimble and that everyone in our, our municipal infrastructure, whether you're the permit check person or, or building planning, that we understand that our idea is to get people to yes. Tell them how to get these businesses activated and to get the changes in the infrastructure they made. If they're going to a previously non-conforming property and they're gonna rehab it, what does that take and what are the implications for their business? Getting them answers quickly so we can incent people to move in. Also, we have to make sure the infrastructure builds them for success. You know, we have fiber going up and down, fiber optic cable going up and down El Segundo Boulevard, making sure that that high-speed internet makes it north-south instead of just east-west for those businesses to really activate. And ensuring that the road traffic that we take off El Segundo Boulevard and put on Franklin doesn't end up on Mariposa, which I know the Mariposa and Maple people definitely don't want to see. Uh, there's mixed-use opportunities, there's Smoky Hollow adjacent, it's, it's all really exciting, it's a win. Thank you. So we'll start here and go that way. El Segundo has signed on to the bike master plan, eliminating two lanes from Rosecrans and one lane from El Segundo Boulevard. What is your position on the bike master plan? Go with me on this? All right. You know, I'll say, look, the bike master plan, uh, I, I will confess, I rode my bicycle to the Green Line for five years, so you would ordinarily think that something that makes biking safer and easier, I am the fish in the barrel for you to shoot. But I will tell you, any of us that lived through the bike lane accommodation on Vista Del Mar know exactly what ticking time bomb the bike master plan is. If you were talking about making Rosecrans a two-lane road for extents, that is something that, I mean, wanna talk about the good idea ferry visiting and then needing to go away. The good idea ferry in this. So the bike master plan, if anyone hasn't checked it out, is something that I, if it ever comes to life, uh, it will look like the French Revolution. Uh, so I, I, it is not in our benefit. It is certainly not in the interest of bike riders. Uh, it is something that may work in the Netherlands, but will certainly not work here. Uh, and I, I cannot be, I don't want to make light of it because it's a real document and was approved. Uh, but I am an emphatic, let's, let's revisit this and think twice about how it will involve us. 
the bike master plan has been around for a long time and yes it was written by bicycle riders so you can understand these bicycle enthusiasts love it they would like their own lane painted green down main street in santa monica we've seen some spots where it worked well we've seen other areas where it hasn't what i can tell you is we should adopt something along the lines of like sharrows like sharrow lanes that we see in redondo beach there are bicycles around us. We want people not using their cars. If we do not want to add lots of parking on Main Street, angled parking, careful what I say, uh, we're going to want them coming down to Main Street on bicycles. One of the reasons why I love living in this town is I don't have to cross but one major highway on my bicycle to get to the beach. And riding around this town is important and making it safe. So working with both the residents and the bicycle enthusiasts to come up with a plan that can work for both of us, I think serves serves us quite well as a town. Thank you. As my uh, two colleagues over here have already kind of mentioned, we've seen what the negative effects uh, of this can be. So I'm gonna kind of turn the question a little bit into what would be in the best interest of the city uh, to do. And I, we've touched on it a little bit, is that I do believe that a, a bike sharing, electric bike sharing type of operation where you're being able to put bike docks, whether it be at the transit or the train is, or at the hotels, businesses to be able to funnel traffic downtown for us and maybe putting in a bike, putting the lines in, I think that would have a more positive uh, effect on, on the city and on, on the, and the residual effects of the businesses in town. Uh, but overall, I, I, I do have some of the same similar concerns about the bike master plan that, uh, that, we, uh, that has already been mentioned here tonight. Thank you. My husband's an avid bike rider, so he probably has a different view than I, but I was one of those that would be driving. And what I noticed with these bike paths, it actually makes the people driving in the cars more aggressive, and they get very upset at them. I can't understand on Rosecrans, with all the new businesses that are going there, with the new mall and at the point, there's going to be a lot more traffic there, and I think it's going to be very dangerous to incorporate a lot of bike paths there. We have a bike path down at the beach. I know we're trying to incorporate more bike paths so they can get to work. I understand that. But I just think we need to look into some other areas of maybe crossing over there at a different place aside from Rosecrans, where it's extremely busy. Thank you. So um, for each of you, we'll begin at the end and come this way. Do you have a specific skill set that would enable you to uniquely contribute to our community? I'm taking a project management certification course, which I'm really excited about because I just think when you're on city council, if you know what projects are all about and you kind of have that workflow and timeline and you're relying on other people or other departments to know about getting projects done, when you have that skill set, you know what's right and what's wrong, why it's taking too long, if it's done correctly. Um, I also have been in management. I've been in public relations and, and marketing. So I think uh, if you're marketing the city, you need to entice people to come here and to spend money. Um, so as far as my skill set, and then one of my best skill sets is really listening, listening to you. Because I think the residents, you're the ones that are living here. You know what you want. So I'm going to be stealing a little bit from what my actual closing statement was. So you're going to get a little preview of that right now. Um, I have a very diverse business background. Um, I've worked from Fortune 500 companies uh, to living and working overseas to working for family-owned entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial companies here in the state. So my, my business background is vast and my life experiences are vast. So I am used to being able to get along, get to yes, work with diverse groups of people. I've never been the Lone Ranger type. I don't have to be that. That's not been successful. So I think the, the best skill set I have uh, in the business piece of it is being able to work within groups, being able to understand and accept other people's um, uh, opinions, and be able to come to solutions that are in the best interests um, of whatever situation I'm in. Thank you. Unique skill set. Uh, my level of experience and the fact that I'm a homegrown candidate. And I grew up here. I, El Segundo, and you know this because we're all El Segundoans, we're a little different. We do things a little different, and that's okay. That's what makes us special. That one, that's what makes us stand out from the crowd. We're not just another South Bay city. Ears gotta be stronger than our voices. All of us are presenting quite well here tonight, but who can listen the best? 
I came to the realization many years ago that I'm not the smartest person in the room, and I am okay with that. I listen to experts, I take their counsel, and I apply it. If you look at my record on the Planning Commission, I'm never the one sticking to my guns, only voting for my opinion. I listen to you, the residents, and I apply what you say. I advocate for you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, pragmatism sometimes gets a bit of a, of a bad name. You know, if you're grounded in a certain philosophy and ethics, then being pragmatic and approaching those is a strong suit. You know, much like a lot of us, I, I, I'm a very broad but not particularly narrow on specifics. I like to aggregate information. I don't apologize for my da love of data and research. Right? When we have 50-odd commissioners who volunteer their time in the city and 240 employees, and God knows how many of the residents who will answer your door, or answer the door when you press the ring door knocker on them, uh, you, know, you can get a lot of information. Right? So what I do and my methodology, whether it was in the military having to listen to the communicator, or the artilleryman, or the aviator, uh, or in the private sector, or at Homeland Security when you have to work across 31 different departments, so you have to be able to aggregate information from people who have expertise take that in and make a sound decision based upon it. So that skill set, I think, has applicability here uh, when you're on the city council. And I would hope that, that anyone who is elected has a little bit of that. I like to think that that is something that I have a lot of. So. Thank you. So we have time for two more questions, and then they'll have final statements. Um, and so I think we'll take this question and start here and go down. Um, how do you discourage homeless people from hanging out in El Segundo? That's your question. How do you discourage homeless people from hanging out in El Segundo? Well, I think the, the issue isn't about whether you encourage or discourage, right? It's about finding appropriate resources for people. And I think that you know, whether someone's mentally ill or they're destitute or transient or living in their car because it's a safe place to park overnight, you know, we want to lean on the county resources that have been made available. All of us voted, right? All of us voted on Measure H. We pay a chunk of our sales tax to subsidize that. We get a lot of money from that as a city to interact and provide county services for those people. We have a police officer whose entire salary is paid for through Measure H funding, right? That involves some specialized training, and I know our police don't want to be first responders for the homeless, but in a city like this, they have to be, right? And it's not a matter necessarily of law enforcement. It's a matter of contacting those people to make sure that we can assess them and send them to the appropriate county service. Because we have a responsibility to citizens for quality of life, right, and safety and security. But it takes between four and seven contacts with someone to get them into treatment, right? And that treatment may be a shelter and maybe taking to Marina Del Rey for psychiatric care. But those are the things that we equip people with here to involve we're making a humane contact with people and get them to services and not necessarily deterring or encouraging. Yeah. Bad question. How do we discourage homeless people? You, you never want to discourage someone. You want to help them. We're a great community. We have a heart. Our police department is trained. Our police department utilizes the county resources, brings out county employees to go and make contact with these homeless people. Step one is make contact. Try to help them. Okay? They're actually not breaking the law. They're just here. If we help them and if we leave with, lead with this concept of help and we're genuine in that concept, they will accept the help. We will then be able to place them elsewhere in a county facility, something like that. But if you see a homeless person, don't be upset at them. You can call the police and say, hey, here's a guy, his name's Steve, can you go help him? And we should help him. We're a better community than that. Well, I first of all, I think there has to be a degree of empathy uh, when we're looking um, at the homeless in town. Okay, but the second piece of it is, is that El Segundo is just not set up to help to rehabilitate uh, or to help out the homeless population that we have. The key really is, as, as Chris mentioned on, on Measure H, there is funding for this, there are programs for this. The key is going to be, how do you get the people that we have here directed towards the substance abuse problem or uh, treatment for that, psych treatment, um, job training, what, whatever it is that, that has to be done that we have programs set up for, that is the key. How do we go, go from where we're at now to get the individual's help? Um, so I don't really think it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, discouraging. I think we have an opportunity to help. We have a particular place to take them to do this, and I think we should do what we can. Thank you. This is not something that Elsa Gundo can do all alone. We are going to get help from the county. That's why we have Measure H, and that's why we had Proposition HHH. 
They have these programs for the homeless. A lot of these homeless don't know that there are programs for them. And I believe our police are going up to them and asking them in what form they need help. If they need food, if they need mental, uh, mental illness help, then uh, there are programs for this. They just need to be directed. The thing is, if we feed them, they will stay. And I know that they need, they need food, and I'm very empathetic of that, but that's what the programs are for, and that's why we did measure H in Proposition HH8. We have to know that there are programs out there. They are out at the front skirts of our town. That's the face of El Segundo. We can't draw people in with tourism if we have homeless right all over Sepulveda. So it's important that we do the right thing as a community. We get them to help. We get their help. But they shouldn't be out here. It's safety concerns, and it's not right for El Segundo. Thank you. Thank you very much. This will be the last question, and then you'll have time for final statements. <clears throat> El Segundo does not have real ocean access. How do you plan to work with the city of Los Angeles and Chevron to improve ocean access? So we'll start here. Oh, no, let's start over there and go this way. I, yeah, I thought we had ocean access. Um, well, according to this person, you don't. Oh, or they, or they, I'm glad or they, we have ocean access. Or they want more. I just envision this trolley taking people down to the ocean and bringing them over to Main Street and spending money. But um, uh, I, yeah, I'm proud of our ocean access. Um, maybe there isn't enough. Um, we have Imperial Ocean Access. We have Grand. Um, how can we encourage more? Uh, our, our beaches, maybe we can set up them to be nicer. I, I'm not in favor for a dog beach. Um, I, more tourism, maybe in the hotels, we can encourage, you know, they have bike rentals to be able to go down there, some type of shuttle service. Uh, but we do have ocean access. Last time I looked. All right, so the question on improving ocean access. So I, I'm guessing on this, what they're looking for is walk access uh, from El Segundo is the only thing I can think of, because obviously if with a bike, a car, what have you, you can drive and access whatever beach you'd like. Um, so to be honest, I don't know how to answer this question because I don't know what I could ask Chevron to do to funnel everybody through Chevron to walk down to the beach. Uh, I don't know if any of you have a problem getting to the beach. I haven't had a problem getting to the beach. So I, I don't mean to make light of the question, but I simply have no idea how to uh, answer it other than to ask Chevron to put a walking path down to the, to the beach. Sorry. We have ocean access, Grand Avenue. Do I have 30 seconds? Yeah, that was quick. I was like, <laughs> Time whoa. Was quick. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, cut me off. Uh, Grand Avenue, I love Grand Avenue. You know, if you grew up in this town, you know, like, that is, that's the Everest. You know, you go on a bike ride, you go on a run, you better make it up that hill on your beach cruiser. Yeah, no, no speeds, okay, no speeds. This is, this is a beach cruiser, you gotta get up that hill. And when you run, you gotta get up that hill. We actually have a little memorial at the top of that hill for a previous uh, city manager, Ron Cano. He used to run that hill every day. Uh, could we make it prettier? Yes, we could. I'm gonna let him talk about that because I know he loves that. <laughs> uh, the irrigation was just recently replaced in all the trees that line both sides, which is an important thing. Tree Musketeers worked on that in the past. I actually volunteered with them on that initiative. And just know that Grand Avenue, it's who we are. We're a town. Let people keep driving by us on Vista Del Mar. It's okay, we don't need them. We like our hill. If they don't wanna walk up the hill or run up the hill or ride up the hill, that's their problem. If you're an El Segundoan, you know you get up that hill and at the top of that hill is the prize. I'm not volunteering to run up that hill. Uh, <laughs> I will hire a stunt double for that. But I think when it, 
When it comes to our beach access, I think what a lot of us are alluding to is it's the quality of that access as well. You know, I'm delighted that the irrigation has, has been replaced for those trees. I am more than delighted about the paint wrapping that's going to occur on the tank on the south side of Grand uh, with the mural being put in there. Uh, I would love to see that as we get improvements on the Imperial side, that the next set of streets improvements make that crossing more appetizing and safer so that when kids come down Grand and go to cross the street, that that light is, is a, something that is amenable, usable, and keeps them out of the threat of turning traffic. Uh, I would like to see our septic system in that bathroom uh, be somehow taken out of the fourth century BC because it currently is designed to flow uphill, uh, which <laughs> will not work, uh, barring any change to gravity. And you know, just the quality of how that beach is maintained is all a matter of our cooperation with the county. You know, we used to have a great advocate with our previous supervisor. Our current supervisor is an old LA City Council person and is less interested in our quality of life on county uh, apertures. So I think that there's some, some headway to be made there as well. Excellent. So it's time for final statements. I believe you have two minutes for those, is that correct? Oh. <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> I believe you have two minutes for those. So let's begin here and go that way. But here. <laughs> with Homeland Security. Lead off hitter. I, Ricky Henderson and Lou Brock rolled into one. Um, you know, when we send voters to the polls, you know, some of us you know well, some of us you, you, you may not know as well. So I would ask that you do two things, right? The first is, is you're going to evaluate what are our new ideas, right? What's the, what is the fresh idea or something that someone brings? You know, sometimes the fresh idea is someone look for with an outsider. So if you hear me when we come to meet and greets, or if you ask me after a forum like this, what do I think about the pension room, and how do I think that we can pay it off, and how do we grow businesses to offset that with 80 odd percent of our tax revenue, what are my thoughts on that? Well, that goes in the fresh idea bucket. And if you want an hour of my time, I will give it to you to discuss it. But those are the first two years of what you get out of any elected official. What are the new ideas and what faith do I put in them to be able to implement it? You know, on my end, the fresh ideas may be that tax piece, but also a degree about what nimble government looks like and how to orient and motivate uh, the employees that we have to carry out our big blue arrow tasks, our big blue arrow tasks, Smoky Hollow, let's get businesses in. So those are those two years. But the other part is, do you trust our judgment, right? The breadth and depth of someone's service on the city council is, do you know their thought process? You know, a lot of us get come to these things because we don't feel like our voice is necessarily heard in the body politic. So you come to this and say, I've heard how this guy aggregates information. I've heard him justify his opinions based on data. And is that what I want out of a public servant? So when you ask of those two things, I think that is something that I bring and would ask for your vote upon. You know, my body of work in town is based on volunteer pieces that involve my children. My body of work and service on the public side is principally around military and government, but secondarily around, around corporate governance. But those skill sets, I think, are directly applicable to the city council. So I will see you all around the Easter egg roll tomorrow, I'm sure, looking just as panicked and miserable as I will be with my children. <laughs> but by the same token, uh, it is part of what makes the city special. Uh, and the involvement and participation of people in events like this and events like that are what makes the city go. And I will ask for your vote, and I will ask you for it 100 times tomorrow. So <laughs> I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We, the people of El Segundo, are what makes her so special. And yet we all see this town through a different set of lenses. I'm lucky enough to say that I've seen this town through the lens of a child, a student, a young adult, a volunteer, a business owner, a parent, and a planning commissioner. I've yet to wear certain lenses in this town, and for that I will turn to those who have come before me and ask for their advice and their counsel so that we, your future stewards of town per se, do not make the same mistakes that we have before. My wife and I believe that actions speak louder than words. We've chosen to live a life that is filled with volunteering and giving back to this great community. We pride ourselves on being community leaders and getting others to volunteer to give back to this community. I believe El Segundo is built from a city standpoint on three pillars, and that is education, infrastructure, and safety. And us, the community of El Segundo, the only reason we're able to thrive is because those three pillars stay intact. 
My goal as your city council person or future city council person is to keep those three pillars intact and, intact and continue to encourage involvement within our community. I love this town to a fault. I've said it before. And I'll leave you with this. There's this quote that I love. It says, do what you love in the service of those who love what you do. I hope you vote on April 10th, and I hope you give me the honor of being the next city council person here in town. Thank you. So over the last hour or so, you've heard us answer a lot of different questions and see how we think on our feet and how we respond, and, and that's always very important. But in the end, it comes down to what is it that qualifies me to be your choice for a seat on city council? And I kind of mentioned it before, I have a, a very diverse uh, business experience background of 28 years from Fortune 500 company Procter & Gamble um, to working in the footwear manufacturing industry in the middle of China and Mexico, um, and then of course to the local entrepreneurial companies I've been working for for the past 20 years. Um, as the current and former president of two different local sports leagues in town, I have had the experience of uh, speaking in front of city council several times, uh, working with the planning commissions, working with the rec and park commissions, uh, working with the El Segundo Unified School District as well as a superintendent in advocating for things for my league. So I have a combination of experiences uh, between community and business. Along with the 18 years that I have been a member of the community itself, this gives me a very unique set of skills and a unique perspective that I bring to the table. I am someone who has the background, the experience, the knowledge, and the ability to make informed decisions but also understands that preserving the identity and the character of El Segundo is the most important thing above all. So as you make your final decisions over the next 10 days, or some of you who have a mail-in ballot handy, you could do it right now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with three promises that I can make you on, on, for, for myself on city council. Number one is I'm never going to abstain from a vote. You elect people to run and to decide, and I will be one of those people. Number two, I was always acting what I feel is in the best interest of the city and the community. And number three, I will be transparent. You may not like everything that I do. However, you will understand the methodology uh, and decision making that I use to get there. On April 10th, I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. I have worked ever since I was 15 years old. Um, I've worked in all different capacities, management, uh, public relations. Um, so I have a broad view of a lot of things. Uh, I don't have a business here, so I don't have any, any motive, really, um, other than I just want to serve my community. That's the type of person that I am. Uh, one of my largest strengths is listening, and uh, I know how to get things done. I'm a mother. We can micromanage a lot. Really good. Um, but I've listened to your concerns, and I know that your concerns on certain streets are different uh, all throughout the neighborhood. And you know, some, some can be solved very quickly, and other ones take a little bit longer and more perseverance. Uh, I do understand that the younger generation, they want environmentally sustainable uh, cities. The middle generation wants technology and infrastructure that can be competitive with other cities. And then the seniors want to have their facilities and senior programs and updated senior facility programs, make sure that they're safe and sound and, and nice. Um, we have that all right here. It just needs to be tweaked a little bit. But uh, the, the council has been doing that. I, every time I research about the city, I am just that much more prouder. I, I really am. I just I knew that I lived in a great place, and now I really know that I live in a great place. So um, anyways, my experience, I worked at Boeing, so my experience in aerospace and in healthcare IT is perfect for the vision of El Segundo. I know where we came from, I know where we're going, and I truly appreciate this company, uh, this company, I'm talking, um, El Segundo. And uh, I'm very excited in promoting and marketing El Segundo. I think it's gonna be a sure win. It's gonna be so easy to promote this town and get people in here to spend money. I really appreciate your vote, and I humbly appreciate your vote on April 10th. Thank you. Thank you.
so um, we have a little additional program regarding Measure C that will be on your ballot, and Joe Lilio is here to speak. But before we get to that, could you please give your candidates a round of applause? Hi, you're not Joe Lilio. I know, I'm going to introduce Joe. Okay, so um, before we leave, uh, so on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Beach Cities, um, I want to thank my two colleagues from the League for coming tonight and doing the timekeeping and going through the cards. And um, those of you that would like to sign uh, the League of Women Voters petition to address commercial property taxes, please join us over there at the table in the other room. Thank you very much. And I have no idea who this is, but he's here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just a strange, strange guy that ran, ran up on the stage, right? Um, Greg Carpenter, I'm the city manager. Um, and, and Joe Lilly and, uh, Lilly and I are going to tell you about Measure C, and we can do this in four minutes, right, Joe? Absolutely. And, and actually, um, I don't want to shortchange this, so Joe and I will stick around after the meeting and, and answer any other questions that you have about Measure C. But there is one other item on the ballot uh, besides the, the two council um, seats on the 10th, and that's Measure C. And Measure C has some, some details and some complicated pieces behind it, but actually the concept's really simple, um, super simple. And that is, if the city finds itself in a place where the county has passed a sales tax increase in the future, those dollars co come back to El Segundo instead of going to the county to use for some other purpose, which we may not, may not even agree with. So Measure C is, is designed by the city council to be a preventative tax measure. Um, I'll say it one more time, simply, it is a tax that, you, that we will pay only if we have to pay it anyways because the, count, the county has passed a sales tax which would affect the entire county. So I'll let Joe Lilio, our director of finance, probably the best director of finance in the South Bay, give us a little bit more detail on this, then Joe and I will stick around after the meeting to answer any questions. All right, Joe? So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be respectful of your time. I know it is very late. This was supposed to be a 30-minute presentation, uh, but I'll, <laughs> just joking. Uh, we'll try to make it four to five minutes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Carol for uh, reaching out to Greg and I, inviting us here uh, to speak before everyone. Um, we do appreciate that. Uh, and also, there are copies of the presentation uh, here in front and in the back room on the table. Also, we do have a Measure C fact sheet um, that was put together and approved by our city attorney. That's also here in the front and the back table. And these items are also on our city's website as well. Um, so I'd like to start off, let's give a real quick high level um, presentation, uh, discussion on sales tax in general. So right now the legal limit in LA County for sales tax is 10 and a quarter percent. Um, right now in El Segundo it is nine and a half. So it leaves a three quarter cent window uh, before that cap is reached. Um, and real quick, the breakdown on that nine and a half, um, six and a quarter goes to the state, two and a quarter goes to LA County, and that leaves 1% that goes to the city. And kind of put it in perspective, if you go to a restaurant and your bill was $100 even before tax, um, that nine and a half uh, percent means there's gonna be a $9.50 tax on your bill, bring it to $109.05. Uh, 650 goes to the state, to the state, 225 to the county, one dollar to the city. So that kind of breaks it down, puts things in perspective. Um, there are currently five active sales tax measures by LA County that total that two and a quarter. Um, four of them do not have a sunset date, so they're in perpetuity. So there's two percent of that that is in perpetuity, unless I guess the voters would uh, try to put something on a ballot to um, counter that. But um, and then there's one measure, Measure H, that does um, expire in 2027, and that's a quarter cent, the homeless tax. And kind of put things uh, in focus a little bit, um, I'll break down some of these propositions. So uh, Proposition A was the first uh, half cent county tax that was put in place in 1980. Um, again, there's no sunset date on that. Um, city residents, businesses, and visitors contribute about $6 million a year for this half cent. In turn, the county allocates $315,000 back to the city. Um, measure M, this was uh, effective July 2017 transportation tax. Again, that's a half cent tax. And again, to put it, things in perspective, um, the city's contributing about $6 million a year. Again, residents, businesses, and visitors. Um, the county allocates $235,000 back to the city every year. 
Um, so now I'm going to talk about Measure C again, real high level. Uh, Greg did mention this is a preemptive measure. So there's three quarter cent sales tax. Um, if residents would pass it, uh, again, it's on the April 10th ballot. If residents do pass it, it does not become implemented, it does not become effective until LA County places a local sales tax measure on the ballot. So that's a trigger mechanism. Um, and then if the county's ballot does uh, pass by countywide voters, uh, Measure C would remain intact. If county voters uh, would uh, decline that county measure, then Measure C becomes inactive. Um, and then uh, just real quick, uh, Measure C was placed on the ballot by uh, all five city council members, so it was uh, unanimously uh, supported by all five city council members. Only needed four to be placed on the ballot. Um, city council unanimously signed off on the argument in favor of Measure C, which could be found on the city's website. It was probably mailed out with your ballot information as well. No organization or individual submitted an argument against Measure C. Um, and Measure C does require 50% uh, plus one uh, voter approval. And uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, how, much does, uh, how much funding will Measure C generate annually? And this is on the fact sheet that's um, also handed out here and on our website. It would be $9 million annually, annually to the city. Uh, will the city of El Segundo have control of Measure C revenue? Yes, city will have 100% local control of that $9 million. So none of it will have to be um, given to the county and you know, they only allocate a small portion back to us. So we'll have 100% control of um, all the revenue. What can this funding pay for? Measure C sales tax is a general purpose tax. So the local revenue goes into the city's general fund. It could pay for infrastructure improvements, which are much uh, needed, um, park improvements, public services, and general government purposes throughout the city. What are some of the current local sales tax in our neighboring communities? Uh, we have Hawthorne, which is going to be 10 and a quarter beginning April 1st, so in a couple days. Long Beach is at 10 and a quarter. They've been there for a while. Santa Monica is at 10 and a quarter. Culver City at 10%, Inglewood at 10%, uh, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, Torrance, Gardena, Lawndale, all at nine and a half. And uh, just put things in perspective too, Measure H that passed um, by LA County voters in March 2017 became uh, effective of October 2017, did not impact uh, the city of Long Beach and Santa Monica. So they were already at that 10 and a quarter cap, so it didn't, uh, raise that above 10 and a quarter. However, they're recipients of Measure H funding from the county. And that does uh, conclude my presentation. I'll be here afterwards if you would like to ask any questions of myself. Thank you for listening. Thank you.